fascinated my interest to come here. And he would, uh, uh, he would invite me, you know, when he finished and he got back here, he would invite me for his seminar. So in those days, you could see the seminar hall, which uh, somewhere there. Okay. I've never seen this hall, first time I'm coming here. So he invited me to one of the seminar hall meetings. And by the time I came, all the seats were completely full. And uh, where to go? You go right up to the top, and as you go to the top, you're almost touching the roof. So I was standing there looking very embarrassed as to what to do. And then uh, one urology resident took pity on me, and he offered me a seat, and very graciously sat on the ground. And uh, I, I took the seat because it was very embarrassing for me to stop. And that urology resident is uh, none other than the present director of the Mass Hospital East Chandra. Why did I choose this topic, the last lecture? I need, you should Google this talk. Now, the last lecture is a series by the University of Pittsburgh, I think the Carnegie Mellon University at Pittsburgh, where uh, it's a topic where any professor of some standing is invited to the university and he's told, now if this is going to be your last lecture, what is your message? And paradoxically for this person, it was his last lecture almost because he had pancreatic cancer with uh, multiple metastases. This is a talk uh, worth uh, listening to. It is there on YouTube. You could listen to it. But then I was caught on the topic. But it took a lot of courage for me to put that topic for my talk at the last lecture. You know, uh, why is that so? Steve Jobs was once asked, what is that which made you one of the most successful business persons in the world? And again, there is another very inspiring talk which you need to Google, uh, Steve Jobs, his lecture at, uh, for, which you know, Stanford, talk at Stanford, extremely inspirational. And he tells in his lecture what was one of the secrets which made him such a great business person in the world. And he said, every day I live as if it is going to be my last. And if you live each day as if it is going to be your last, then every day it has a certain sense of completion. You do that day, anything on your mailbox, whatever you need to complete, you complete that day. Because in a way it's true. From the field of neurosciences and from other fields, you know, you know how we get people every day in our casualty with cyber and road traffic accidents. That human life can be compared to a dew drop which is dancing on the wind and you really do not know how long. Now, normally we don't like to address the fact of your own death. You know, whenever the topic of death, we, we tend to black ourselves off because we don't want to directly address it. But there is one uh, work by Adi Shankara called the Bajagovindan song which uh, uses these words. for a trek in the Tibetan Himalayas, a place where I've always had a dream to go to. I think we'll just wait for the projection to come on. And that is to go to Kailash and Manasarovar. Am I still audible? Yes. Yeah. It's a project that takes some time to come. Now, if you have to go to Kailash and Manasarovar, I know there is there are, uh, somebody who's a big expert here at Nirmahans who's been there many times. Anything about 12,000 feet is high altitude, and you really do not know how the body is going to take on altitudes more than 12,000 feet. Now, the Lake Manasarovar is at 15,000 feet, and if you wish to do the Parikrama around Mount Kailash, you go to 19,400 feet. This trek, you know, even today, just before I came, I had to fill a declaration form. And the declaration form includes so many things, including death. You know, are you, are you the organizers? Yeah. So this place, Kailash, there are two rocks in the world which attract a lot of people. One is Mount Kailash. The other similar rock is at, at Kaaba. You know, the rock at Kaaba, Mekka, where people drawn to. Now, this is 
very inhospitable, inaccessible. The Chinese really don't welcome you too well, and there are absolutely no proper living conditions. So for the actual, uh, the parikrama, the parikrama is the most important part of the whole experience. Uh, and as I said, we are in high, high altitudes. We are going to altitudes around 19,400 feet. And there is a very symbolic step that you need to go to, and that you enter through this door called Yamadwar. Yamadwar technically means you are taking permission from Yamadharma Rai. And uh, this is the symbolic picture I have got of Yamadharma Rai. Yamadharma Rai may be the god of death, but he is also a great teacher too. If you have read about the Kato Upanishad, in the Kato Upanishad there is a story. There is a story of a little boy who had a premature death and he had to he had to go to Yama's place. And there you have Yama portrayed as a teacher, as a teacher of life. There is a book which has inspired me a great deal called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. He died recently and he died of, uh, of chronic subdural hematoma. You know, for neurosurgeons, there, you may think it's a very simple procedure, but the mortality in chronic subdurals can be quite high and he died of a chronic subdural. Now, in this very inspirational book, he talks of the second habit. This whole talk is about the second habit. The second habit means begin with the end in mind, which means he does a wonderful exercise in which he puts each person through a process where uh, you are at your own funeral. And when you are at your own funeral, a lot of people are going to speak about you. And there he says he makes you write your own script. And what it does is it makes you in charge of your life. Now, the big question is, am I the creature of my life or am I the creator of my life? The creator is, I write the script of my life and I live my life according to my script. Now, is it possible to be the creator of your life? Is it possible to write the script? And this is the whole training in this wonderful book. Begin, factor yourself 20 years, however much years you take to go to there and begin back. You know, it is said, the problem in life is not that we are not able to accomplish great things. The problem is that we don't set great things to accomplish. Every creation, he says, happens in the human mind. You visualize it and then you actualize it. There was a great Indian master, you know, who gave a clue. If you are doing this exercise, you see, what are those three things, or what are those few things which I need to factor are very, very important before I leave this world. And he said, there are three renas. And my whole talk is on how we can fulfill these three renas. They are called Titra Rana, Loka Rana, Rishi Rana, or Achari Rana. The first step is to our parents. Clearly, no one has done more for us than our parents. And if you look into your own life, you will see this step is essentially unfulfillable. We are, we are able to do a lot for our children, but we are not able to do for our parents what they have done to us. But this master has said there is a way out. He said, if you live your life in such a way that others are able to say, so lucky your parents are that they have a daughter or a son like you, you fulfill Chitrana. We get more and more preoccupied with our lives that we have less and less time for our parents. Now, he tells us in various ways, can you factor your parents very important in your life and always acknowledge that we are what we are today because of our parents and because of the blessing that we have on our parents. Are you ready to repeat this after me? You know, uh, he says, begin the day with Matra Devo Baba, Pitra Devo Baba, Acharya Devo Baba. The vision is my parents whether alive or not, especially your mother, visualizes you and is radiating her good wishes to you wherever you are. Your mother is still having you in your vision. Am I there to be recipient to it? And in today's age and time, when we become more and more nuclear families, we move away from our parents. And because we are economically well off, our parents are usually well taken care of, but we are not there physically for our parents. There was one example which is not a very uncommon example 
of an elderly couple who had children who did very well for their lives and they become very successful. Your country cannot contain them anymore. They are attracted by countries abroad. And so the children were employed in uh, some other countries. And because everybody were well, well off, they were, the parents were well provided. And one thing is very certain, as parents grow older, one thing is very true, one of the couples will be earlier. And usually it is consistently seen that women are spiritually and psychologically stronger than one of the spouse goes. And it is a man is usually completely shattered when a person loses his spouse. Here, the wife went ahead and the man was extremely lonely. Now the children were well to do, they were providing him whatever he required. There was an attendant with them all the time. And after, the, after the, he became confined to the bed, he was given a bell. And all he could do was just ring a bell and the attendant would come. He says, can I have some water? He says, sure. Water was brought. After some time, he rang the bell. The attendant comes to him and says, has a newspaper come? He says, sure, sir. The newspaper has come. The third time, the bell rang and the attendant comes to him and says, uh, uh, what is it, sir? He said, did I ring the bell? You know what he wanted. You know, one of the big problems is loneliness. But there is no one with whom you can share yourself. He really wanted someone to be with him. After some time, the old man died. And when he died, his children and grandchildren from different parts of the world came. And the house was bustling with activity. And once the body was cleared, and then old people keep, you know, money wherever they will find it easy to find other books inside books in all various places. So when they wanted to clear all his belongings, they looked for um, anything of value. So they searched all his belongings thoroughly. They found money and other things of value in different places. So whatever was of value, they divided among the children. And whatever was of no value to anybody, they kept it aside to be trashed. And in that trash bill, then was the bell. Now the grandson spotted that bell and said, Papa, don't throw it, it will be useful one day. <laughs> Now, we, whatever actions we do, we give a role model for our own children. And therefore, it is recommended that, you know, normally at our workplace we keep pictures of our spouse and children. Why not keep a picture of our parents? You know, the very presence of the parents on your workplace, in your home, on, on your desktop, of your computer, makes a certain difference because they bring about a sense of reverence. And at this moment, what I am, I acknowledge the blessings of my parents and it is a tremendous amount of signal that you give the generation next. The next is Lokarana. Lokarana means can I contribute to the society the very best? I am today a product of the work of my predecessors and can I be certain that before I leave this world I will be able to give as much as possible to you? The second debt is the debt to our community, the debt to society. Now, whenever we see our patients, one thing is very certain that compared to our patients, we are so much physically and psychologically well off. And if you acknowledge that we are healthy, you know, we are filled with the thought of the attitude of gratitude. Throughout our waking days, let us see what I can do to make a difference to society. I am speaking to everyone who is PhD plus, who is a postdoc here. You know, when I was in school, I had, a, uh, I was in a Jesuit institution. The founder of the Jesuit institution was St. Ignatius of Loyola. And St. Ignatius of Loyola would motivate all his people to be as highly skilled as possible. He says, the more training you have, the more skill you have, the more you can qualitatively make a difference to society. And therefore, at our level, you know, whatever work we do can make a quantum difference to people and we. And throughout our waking, let us be able to see how I can give to the community more than what I could do. The Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2 and chapter 3, has given something about the concept of Karma Yoga. There is no greater manual that I can recommend than chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita, which elaborates Karma Yoga's two things right action and right attitude. Right action means can I give of my very best and what is the attitude? Give as if to someone I love. When you are in the medical care, if your patient has been treated like God himself, you know, 
and Kabir was a tailor. And then any person would come for fabric, he says, Oh, my Ram has come, you know, and he will measure him as if this is divine. That little consulting room, if you can visualize that this is the place that I am going to treat, my divine who has come back in the form of my patient, and that is what is called Ishwaratmana Bhav. Whenever I visualize my patient as a manifestation of the divine, I give my very best. The second is called Prasada Bhav. Now in India, I don't have to explain what Prasada is. Whenever you go to a place of worship, you are given something in the form of Prasada. And how do you receive Prasada? Very reverentially, you receive it with great. You feel so blessed that you have got it. Now when you receive the Prasada, you are not going to look at the see what Dr. Satish Chandra has got, you know, because he is the director, he gets more and I get less. You do because you receive it. When you receive the prasad, you are not going to say, the Tirupati is one of better than this. You know, if you are able to accept whatever is the fruit of your action with reverence, and that is what is called prasada bhav. Now, if our work is like a karma yogi, and uh, uh, that fulfills debt number two, the debt to my community. Many years ago, Mahatma Gandhi had made one message. All you have to change is the patient to the customer. You see the greatness in a person, the writing that he had made in the year 1890 when he was still in South Africa in a certain speech. He said, I will use it, the patient is the most important visitor in our premises. He is not dependent on us, we are dependent on him. He is not an interruption of our work, he is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider, he is not the outsider of our business, he is the part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him, he is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. You know, when you are a neurosurgeon, when you see a neurosurgical patient, that patient has created a neurosurgeon in you. Believe me, there is no neurosurgical patient you, as a neurosurgeon, have no existence whatsoever. So a patient creates the doctor, and you are your specialist because of the patient. The third and the most difficult debt is called Acharya Rina, the debt to our teachers wherein we attain to our fullest potential. And the teachers always say there is a lot of talent in us and for various reasons we are not able to realize our true nature. We think we are ordinary people and it is the spiritual teachers will say you seem to be ordinary but the seeming is only the exterior of this there is something of the extraordinary. Now, this is not a talk that I give anywhere, but it is in hands, and I know that I am speaking not to ordinary people, I am speaking to one of the most refined brains in the country. One input which would inspire us was the work of a medical doctor from India, from the Olympia Institute, who brought many of these spiritual concepts in a nice capsule, the seven spiritual laws of success, and somewhere he brings out this fact, we are not human beings with an occasional spiritual experience, but spiritual beings who are not aware of our true nature. Now the whole exercise therefore is to be able to discover our true nature. Now being an enhanced, we have heard the story of little Johnny. Amongst you have heard the story, let's tell you the story once again. Little Johnny didn't have the type of place to go to a regular school, so his parents had to put him into a special school. And one day the teacher gives all of them a piece of clay to do some model with and Johnny was sitting in the corner working on that piece of clay. After some time the teacher comes to him and says, Hello Johnny, how are you? And Johnny says, I'm fine. What do you have in your hand, Johnny? The big smile says, I've got a piece of powder. And the teacher, the little girl, he said, what do you want to do with that? With a nice smile, he says, I want to make a teacher. The teacher is certain something is wrong with Johnny. He calls for the principal. The principal comes to Johnny and says, Hello Johnny, how are you? He says, I'm fine. What do you have in your hand, Johnny? He says, got a piece of powder. And what do you want to do with that? And with a cheeky smile, he says, I want to make a principle. The principle is that something is seriously wrong with Johnny. He calls for the psychologist. Now, psychologist knows how to handle such children. So her approach was a little different. She comes to Johnny and says, Hello, Johnny, how are you? And Johnny says, I'm fine. I know you have a piece of powder in your hand. She says, and he says, yes. I know you want to make a psychologist of it, what is it? Johnny says, no. <coughs> psychologist little shocked. He says, why not? He says, not enough powder. <laughs> <laughs> now, if little Johnny had had brains, what about each one here? You know, 
We are all PhDs and teachers for PhDs and I could train your brains to say, you know, look at this a little differently. We are not ordinary. My body is ordinary, my mind is ordinary, but there is something of the extraordinary in all of us. And the more we are able to straight address the extraordinary in us and be able to acknowledge the extraordinary in us. This is a story, but it is more than a story. It actually happened somewhere near Bangkok or this temple. There was a huge clay statue of Buddha. And because the temple was being renovated, the statue had to be relocated. And in the process, something goes wrong. The statue falls down and breaks. And to their amazement, they discover it is not an ordinary clay statue of Buddha, but a golden statue of Buddha. Many centuries ago, when the Buddhist monks made this golden statue, their concern was how to protect so much gold. And because they did not have the means to protect it, somebody gives them an idea, why not cover it with clay? It was such a carefully guarded secret that when they died and their followers died, they had forgotten that in this temple, they had a golden statue of Buddha. Can you make a connection? You know, this body-mind is the clay me. The embodied within me is one that is waiting for expression. This American author who said this, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Now, if you have to work on understanding who this person is, now it's almost like climbing the Mount Everest for a certain reason. Now, whenever you are climbing high altitudes, one of the important advice given by all physicians is that you cannot go more than 1,500 feet in a single day. You can't do that because the body will not be acclimatized. So there are base camps put at different levels. Even though you may be absolutely physically fit, you go to a base camp, wait for some time, you acclimatize before you go to another level uh, and then go on. Now, that's my danger. I cannot present the whole message, whatever I have understood. You know, my life has been a blessing to come across masters who know what they are talking about. And it will be my great privilege, you know, to be able to share those understandings as a part which have helped me to open my eyes into looking into this area. Can you learn neurosurgery without the help of a guru? Not possible. Without a teacher for neurosurgery, you cannot become a neurosurgeon. And I can say with all, whatever I have understood, the understanding of who you are is a similar process like you go through neurosurgery, neurology, psychiatry, whatever. It is a systematic, nobody can do a PhD as a part-time uh, process. If somebody has done a PhD part-time, you know what type of a PhD it is. It is, it is a preoccupation where you go to a teacher and then in a program, in a systematic manner, are able to understand because this teaching is different from normal teaching. Normal teaching is there is a subject there, there is a topic for there and you are the subject who is trying to understand the object there. But here the problem is the subject that we are talking about is you and the one who is listening to it is also you. Now this is the great difficulty. We are always used to learning something objective. And whenever the scriptures teach you something objective, the training of the mind is so much that we try to make that objective and actually miss the point. And therefore, teachers have their own innovative methods to be able to teach the subject. One example is this. They say, look at this picture. You see a lake, you see a couple, you see a tree, do you see something more? Many of you can see a baby. How many more can see a baby? It is there, but sometimes it requires a teacher to tell you. You know, sometimes it is so obvious. Any more can see an outline of a baby. Okay, I will help you now. Can you see it is there? Okay, now I go back. You are able to see that. Can I give you an exercise now? I want you to watch my hand. It's a very simple exercise, but also a difficult exercise. You are watching my hand, right? This is the typical class these teachers will tell you. In addition to seeing my hand, do you see something else? Other than the ring and the lines of my hand, the gap between my hand and all that. You are seeing my hand. In addition to my hand, there is something else you are seeing. I 
And what is that? I'll give you a clue. The clue is because of that you are seeing my hand. You know the problem is it is so obvious but we still don't see it. Yeah? Somebody said it. You are seeing not only my hand but you see my hand which is perfused with light. Right? If light was not there falling on my hand, you would never see my hand. So what are we seeing? Hand plus light. Right? And then the teacher will go a little further. Now you are seeing my hand not only because of the light, but you have a visual apparatus that is able to receive the hand. Now the question the teacher will take you, is it the eyes that is seeing my hand? Is it the brain that is seeing my hand? Who is there inside you who is watching that hand? In fact, there is one condition called the Kano condition. The Kano condition begins when neurology ends. Really, a student of neurology has to go to the Kano condition. When the student comes to the master and says, Master, I'm seeing, I'm listening. But who is there inside me who is listening? Who is there inside me who is hearing? You know, there are many neurologists who have written articles on the Kano Upanishad making the connection that this Upanishad begins when neurology ends. Now, is it the occipital lobes which I see in the hand? The occipital lobe or the association areas? Or these association areas or my own brain is only a computing device which reports to somebody else because of which you are seeing. For instance, somebody has got all the neurological apparatus in check, the visual apparatus in check, but the person is unconscious on a ventilator and has got a fixed plan into cubits. And you flash light or you put your hands and shake in front of his eyes, is the person able to see? His occipital cortex is alright. The light is falling on the occipital that is going to the visual association area is alright. But that somebody who is supposed to see is not there. Who is that conscious being? This is the big question. Who is there inside you who is listening? Who is there inside me who is able to hear? What the teacher does, you know, in the same story of the Golden Buddha, the teacher takes away from us what we think we are and gives you something which you actually are but we don't know that you are. Can you see that? The teacher takes away the false you. The false you is what is called my ego. My ego that I am a doctor, I am a neurosurgeon and whatever bio data that was read is all for transactional purposes of you. But after some time we get so identified with this periphery of you that you forget the real you. Now this understanding from the peripheral me to the central me may appear difficult but I will tell you if so many people could do it, the brains that are here find it far more easier to do it. You know, when the Wright brothers were making a machine which would fly, a lot of people said not possible. But these two brothers said it may be difficult but possible. I'll give you one example. This is not an example, a story. There was a great master who was uh, relinquishing his position and he wanted a good successor. So he had two people who could succeed him. And he wanted to choose between the two who is going to be the pontiff, the real, like the Pope. Now this man had the ability to select between the two of them. And he gives them a brief. The brief was he gives them an envelope. And he says, I want this envelope and its contents destroyed. But I want you to destroy it in a place where there is nobody. So the first person went into a room, darkened the room, and he was absolutely certain that there could be nobody there. He lit a match, burnt it and accomplished his task. The second person spent the whole 24 hours and comes back to the master and he said, I have not been able to accomplish your task that you gave me. You told me to burn it in a place where there is nobody. But I had a problem. He said, wherever I went, I was there. A people that I. Wherever I went, I was there. Who is this I who goes with you wherever you go? Can you see a picture of yourself when you were a little boy, four years old, or a little girl, four years of age? Look at the family photograph of yours. And my question to you is where is that little boy or girl now? Is she 
here, but she is not here. Difficult to answer because in a way you are the same person who went to school, who was taken to school when you were four years old. You are the same, but is that body of the child there in you now? The body has undergone a complete change. The mind has changed. The memories have changed. Everything has changed, but something essential has never changed. Can you see that? There is something in me that is there all the time. There is something in me that is changing all the time. What is there in me that has never changed? You know, when you come back to the mass after 10 years, the first reaction you feel is, you look at people, my God, you are looking so old. You may not see it, but you don't realize you are also getting old. We never feel we are getting old. Because we log on to that person or that company you from the very beginning. If somebody has said, you have changed, you say, I am not changed, I am the same. Because we log on to that person who never gets old, who never changes. But my body changes, my mind changes. And let me tell you a real example of one of my classmates in school. And she was telling me, she recently had been to Chennai. And the moment she landed there, she had severe toothache, so she had to go to a nearby dentist. And she was waiting for the doctor to come. The doctor had not yet come and she looked up at the name board and the board read Dr. Alan Rodriguez. And the bell rang in her mind, can this be Alan my classmate in school? And you know how the human mind works? Flashback to those far off days when she was in school, thinking of that tall, handsome boy, she had a secret crush on. And as she was thinking of Alan on those days, in comes the doctor, somebody totally different, middle-aged, pot belly and grey hair, balding. She had come for a treatment, she gets a treatment done. She is about to go, she has an inkling of doubt. She says, Dr. Allen, were you in St. Peter's? He says, yes. Were you there between 1966 and 1972? He said, yes. Now with all the confidence, she beams a big smile. Can you recognize me? He looked at her and said, I'm really sorry, madam. I forget what you were teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> Aging happens to your body. You know, aging does not happen to the real me. The real me never gets old, the real me never falls sick, never dies. <coughs> if you are able to understand that, that is the experience of transcendence. You know, Upanishads let us talk of these statements. These are exclamations of the realized person. My eva sakanam jatam, my sarvam pratishnitam, my sarvam dayam yati tad brahma dayam asmayam I will not dare to translate it because if for any I dare to translate it, it will look absolutely ridiculous. It looks so ridiculous because there is a cross disparity between what we experience and the truth. I'll give you one example. Every day we see the sun rise and the sun set. My experience is the sun is setting and the sun is rising. But the truth is just the reverse. Can you imagine those days when Galileo came and made this discovery? He was put into prison because it was contrary to everybody's experience. When the experience is different from the truth, it becomes very difficult to accept. And finally, the Pope wanted to release him because he knew he was, you know, he didn't want to put him in jail. But he, he said, I'll release you on the declaration that whatever you have said is false. So he said, okay, he wants to get out of prison. What I said is not true, but just my declaration is not going to change the truth. How often you have be sitting in a car, with your brakes on, your car is not moving, the car next to you is moving and you actually have a feeling of movement or you've been in a train, your train is not moving, the train next to you is moving and you have a perception of movement. You've been driving on a hot road, you see shimmering water but as you drive past there is no water. You see the blue sky, is there a blue sky, when you see the lake, blue water, there is no blue water. My experience and my reality is that now we tend to believe too much into our experiences. Now if you are able to go beyond the experience, we will go beyond. If you come out of Bangalore airport, you know, you will be coming in and out of the airport, so I would just like you to watch one boarding because for a long drive there are no boardings and from beyond there is private land and when private land starts there are boardings. And there is one boarding that says, you have landed, it says, but have you arrived? What is the definition of when you you say you have the right? You know, each of us have our own definition. And somebody told me one definition which I really love. He says, if you have been able to love, and if you have received love, if your life has been suffused in 
giving love and receiving love, then you have really lived. And this whole training, you know, what it teaches you, initially experiment with love with people close to you, your own family. Slowly, the way you treat people beyond your family, if you can identify each one of them as yours. You know, I had this dog to the lab, and dog lovers will realize, you know, that dogs are an example of unconditional love. Tremendous. And one day this fellow developed uh, I was not home. We operated, he survived two years, and then one day he came with multiple metastases all over, and finally we had to make a painful decision to put him to sleep. You know, and uh, all those who loved the dog were there, and the dog finally, but the dog gave us an experience of what? Of this. Now, once you have loved and you have lost, you have gone through a tremendous amount of pain. Now, people don't have another dog. Then now they said, you know, I'm not going to have a dog at home. Let me experiment with dogs on the street. You know, my neighbors will be unhappy, but I've got dogs on my street and my neighbor's street. And I wake up in the morning and I walk. You know, what a reception you get from these dogs. And between my home and the temple that I go, more important than the God is the dog. I sit with these dogs, spend some time with them. You know, if you are able to relate in a space of giving love and receiving love, this is part. You know, 22 years of my most productive life has been from the I have grown in and through this place, and I have really liked to acknowledge that I have been tremendously from this place, and whatever I have done is uh, to be able to come back and to be able to share. I gave you this topic as last lecture. You know why I put that topic again? 50, about 50 years ago this master died. Uh, he was one of the great enlightened masters. He lived just three hours from my hospital, from Narayan to Narayan to Narayan to Narayan, just three hours. At that time, just before his death, a small child was brought to him with leukemia. And 50 years ago, there was no treatment for the leukemia. And then he gave this little child a mantra, he gave the parents a mantra. Would you like to repeat that mantra? The mantra is this Naham Deham Oham Soham Naham Deham Oham Soham And this was the message of the great master. The message the master said Naham Deham I am not my body. Oham, he says, with all your intellect, the human birth that has given you given you a tremendous amount of intellect to help you to inquire who this person is. And his whole mission, his whole life was, who am I? Nanihar. Inquire, who am I? Then he says, with the help of a guru, with the help of a teacher, you are able to discover what? So I am that. I'll conclude. You know, one of the great understanding is once you, know, you understand what life is, then your whole life becomes one big drama. You know, life is a drama, death is a drama. One day, you know, when you meet Yamadur, today Yamadur is not going to come like on a buffalo like a picture that I showed. Yamadur will come in the form of an MRI report or a biopsy report. You know, somewhere, my whole life's preparation is for that moment, you know, when you get to know your time is up. It is that if you have really lived your life, when that moment comes, you have no problems because you have understood life is one big drama. All of us are given roles for a certain period of time and during that time, if you are able to play your roles and part of the playment of the role is Mitra Lokarina and Vishirina. This mantra becomes meaningful. Asatoma Sadgamya. If the teacher will help you to realize, if I can move from my body, mind, me and my transactional me to Sad, the real me, the embodied me. And that is light, from darkness to light. Prithyor Ma Amritam Kamaya. And that will take me from darkness to light. Thank you very much. Really, you know, if I have to face death, 
and I mentally, you know, it was not easy to give this title at the last lecture, and I had a great reputation in telling my wife I'm going to title this the last lecture. But you know, it's it's that's a process of conditioning to believe that death is a fiction. Death happens, but it happens to the body. You know, as long as it is just an intellectual concept, when death really comes to you, it is, it's going to be a shattering experience. The more and more you live with the fact that death will happen, but not to me, the real me. You know, it may look just like words, but these understanding happens if you come across people who mean what they say. And my good fortune is, I have been primed. My laptop is full of discussions. Dr. Sundar knows, Dr. Sundar Nethra, a part of a little group where, you know, through the help today, great masters are available in, in audio form. And once in a while, you see them in a personal form, but you can have their learnings uh, available to you. And this is my message for you. You know, there is this Bhagavad Gita, but whatever background you come from, if you are able to understand your own scriptures, preferably with the help of a teacher who is able to open up. And among the Indian scriptures, there are so many of them. And at least a few 10 principal Upanishads, if a master is able to unfold, I will tell you, you will be transformed in the sense that you will be walking on holy land. This land that you are walking in is sacred place. You really don't have to go to Kailash to do You know. Parikrama, everywhere where you put your step, that becomes holy land. The teacher is able to transform your own understanding, transform the way you look. And uh, that's why I said, you know, my whole life is a preparation for death. And uh, this last lecture is a series in the Carnegie Mellon University. Now, if you were supposed to give your last talk, this is my message. There are three Rinas, Vitra Rina, Loka Rina, and Rishi Rina. Most difficult of this, because you know you cannot learn it yourself. You have to find a teacher. And if there is a blessing, you find a teacher. And you really don't have to worry about looking for a teacher. It is that the student is ready and the master will appear. You just have to make yourself ready and the question is that the master will appear to you wherever you are. <coughs> Really have 
what I consider the true purpose of life and its fulfillment. You talk of Gita, it's high in fact. This is Chandra, I just presented me a copy of the Gita. You know when I came here, I kept that copy, I'm sure I'll take it back home. But probably I'll not read it, I'll keep it. For me, the real definition of Gita is, have you read the city of joy? The famous book by Dominic and Appiah. As, you know, as I don't mind, as that would happen, I was reading it the 11th time when, when I was coming to this place. I read it 10 times. I suggest all of us must read that book to realize what true God is and what true fulfillment of right life is. Thank you. We both have discussed a lot about uh, uh, Swami Sukhbodhananda where you have got qualified and uh, I've been hearing a lot of spirituality and the work which you are doing for the young students and the uh, adults and other people talking about communication and relationship aspects. Now what I am seeing in your process of life which I have seen for 22 years that you are little unique than others. Like you interact with all disciplines and uh, very, very friendly way and it was very nice having you around with us. Now, what made you to be a little different than other people around? <laughs> so that the extras at least they take over what you have achieved today, what you are. Thank you. <laughs> One is, as you said, uh, we come with a samskar, we come with destiny. There is a certain amount of destiny. Why are you here in enhance? Have you determined to come? You know, there is a certain amount of what happens because of destiny. There is a certain amount that we can do to free will also. Life is a combination of these two things. There is a destiny component which brings us together. There is also a component of freedom. Now, I do not know which component worked more for me, but I'm certainly, this has been a place of great blessings to me. You know, it was my dream place to be here. In my childhood, I went to be here. I grew and I, you know, most of my years of growth was in here. But then I'd like to be with me about it here. In the video, and I, I have a video on my computer, but here is a person who was, uh, you know, within a few months of his death and he comes and speaks to an audience and the most beauty is the way he was able to accept his death. You know, not in any negative sense, but how he could work the most of even that last few months that he had to live without being affected any bit psychologically by the fact that he was going to die. And the fact that he was going to die for the next six months or so, he met so many groups of people to say, the truth is, he might have six months to live. You know, there was one great, uh, who's Arjuna's son, who was cursed to die in seven days, but Parikshit, is it Arjuna's son or grandson? Arjuna's grandson was Parikshit. And Parikshit once was lost in the forest. Absolutely thirsty, he was looking for some water. He was the king of the province. He saw a person in meditation, he would uh, not respond at all. In disgust, he found the dead snake, he threw it on that person. And then later on, and he went away. When that person, the sage son, saw somebody throw a dead snake on him, he cursed him. He said, Whoever has thrown a snake on my father will die of a snake bite within seven days. Now, Parishit's curse was that he had got seven days to live. In those seven days, he met a lot of people. And then somebody asked him, so unfortunate, you have got seven days to live. He said, I have seven days to live. Do you know how many days you have to live? <laughs> he don't know how many days he Now, for me, that was the message. That even though I know I'm going to die, I may not know exactly how many numbers, but if I can value every moment of my life, if I, give, if I can give off my life, first for myself, you know, it is okay to be selfish. It is okay to be selfish to imbibe a certain amount of knowledge. There is a lot that we still have to know. So only once you are imbibed and once you have learned, then you can make a difference to your family, to your organization, your community. So uh, he made a 
me was the great source of inspiration. The inspiration was you can know about the certainty of your own death, but you can live with the cheer that the fact that you are going to die can make you more motivated to live every moment. You know, these become philosophical. Somebody was asking this question, you know, what happens after death? What? So the master gave a nice answer. He said, more important than life after death is life before death. He says, you know, if my day today is good, that guarantees tomorrow is going to be good. If I have wasted my day, then I pay a price for it tomorrow. So the message really that I have learned from what is, Make the most of your today, the tomorrow will be made. Then he said, the other thing that you said, there are these three renams, the three renams, and the uh, Rokha and Rikshena. And, 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 uh, and uh, you said, you get the maximum importance to which then you said, sir. Uh, I thought, I, I, I would say it's no great. You are not more society and doctor. You are not more patient. I would rather give residence to I showed you than the other two. I showed you that, uh, <coughs> in that residence. No, no, I showed you that acclimatization. Yes, you did. You know, I, that acclimatization is a process before a person can understand what is Acharya. Honestly, honestly, if you feel there is something of value, then you have to say that with this form of understanding, we are always used to objective knowledge. But subjective knowledge, you know, when the topic is about yourself, it becomes very, very difficult to understand. Anything objective, you know, the lady who operated for a photo and uh, the problem was because we were very close to the low cranial nerves we could not exercise it completely there was a small residue and when you leave it behind and you do a post op and mark it was a little bigger than what we thought it was and the dilemma was you can't do radio surgery you can't do anything and she had that agony you know what is going to happen 10 years 15 years so she googled and she found an international conference of photo she said very good, she could travel, she had traveled to Washington DC and the topic was Cordobas. So she attended this meeting and everybody was making paper of presentation. She comes back and she tells me, Doctor, every day I would come to the hotel room and cry bitterly because for everybody it's objective, for her it is subjective. You know, there is a different scientific meeting that we are used to are all objective. When you go to the inner world, the teaching is totally different. You need, you know, unless you are able to renounce this total sense of ego, that is why in Indian tradition you have to fall at the teacher's feet. And the teacher should be somebody where you are ready to give up everything for the sake of the teaching. You know, when you value this teaching that I am ready to give up my family, my career, whatever is required, because I know this man can transform my own. So the first job to go beyond level two is to work on the ego. And of course, this level, two things are important. One is prayatna, the other is naiva. There should be a grace. And if there is grace and there is a combination, then we go from level 2 to level 3. And I can say that certainty that all of us, level 2 is very important, level 1 is very important. Thank you. 